Okay, well, hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. Yes, hello. So, um, perhaps, perhaps what are we talking about people. today? Right, each one. Can you guys say who you are quickly? Well, I'm Angel Priest, and uh, I work with uh, Impact Ministries. Amen. And I'm Jessica Strong, and I work with Connect Ministries out of Kansas City. Wonderful. And my name is Abby Lopez. I'm actually Polish Lopez, married to Lopez. <laughs> and I also work for Dr. Jim uh, with both of my great friends and sisters. But today uh, we have very, very special topic. I invited the Jessica and Angel to talk with me on things that, of course, they're going to talk about their lives. But as you listen to us, you can relate to this. Uh, because everyone is going through some situation. We're going to talk about our husbands, families, <laughs> our spouses. In a good way, right? <laughs> Did you hear that excitement? Woohoo! We'll talk about our, our husbands, husbands are too, like, what? What? <laughs> and also, but I'd like to start with from the beginning of our childhood. I have a few questions, <laughs> brief questions that I will ask each one of them to talk about. But mm -hmm. let's start from beginning, girls. Let's talk about our fathers, because our marriages usually, if not for the most part, are a result of what we went through in our childhood. So mm -hmm. if, with that being said, could we start maybe with Jessica? Could you give us a brief background? Or you know what, go for as long as you want. I don't wanna put time limits on you. Tell us about your background, uh, yours as well as your husband's, uh, specifically talking about in this fatherless generation, we want to talk about connection between father and child, father and son, father and daughter. How was your relationship when you were growing up with your father? And then, uh, Angel, I'm going to ask you the same question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so I think um, that your comment about fatherless generation is really applies to me, right? So I met my dad when I was almost 39 years old. For the very first time. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up in a single mom home and we kind of jumped around uh, all over the country. Um, she tried her best to give us like a stable home life, but the, the men in her life were typically um, very abusive in some way or another to mm -hmm. either her or to us. And so we had this very tumultuous and uh, inconsistent father figure um, the one person who was around the most, though, was my grandfather, and he's a very strong personality um, and very present and loving and and really around, but still not a, still not my father. Mm -hmm. So it was. So he uh, was a he was a positive influence, Jessica. Is that what um, you're saying? I, I would say that he was. Um, he loved us passionately and strongly, but mm -hmm. my family has a lot of codependence history. Mm -hmm. So, so there's a lot of, um, um, we can actually, my, my one uncle does the genealogy stuff and he's gone back, mm -hmm. um, several generations and the dramatic stories of abuse and codependency even include murder. Um, okay. so it's been an incredible journey to realize that this has been, Mm -hmm. for at least six generations that we can count yeah. of oh. abuse and emotional instability. Wow. Wow, that's incredible. Wow. Mm -hmm. So tell me, because sometimes we can have uncles, grandpas, and all these other uh, men figure, father figure, but they're not like we look at them as a children as, oh, I wish he could, we look up to them as a father, but they just, sure. they love us, but they don't give us what we need. How mm -hmm. was that with your uh, grandpa. Yeah. So my grandfather actually was really fantastic because he did things like he took me to buy my first bra. Mm -hmm. Um, he took me to buy my first, my prom dress. Like, okay. so he, he drove me to dance lessons. He, mm -hmm. he was an escort for me. I was in a beauty pageant in high school and he uh, was my escort. Right. So he got a tuxedo and walked on the stage and did, so he really did fill a lot of those dad roles for me. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. nice. That's one. Nice. And then you said you met your dad. Do you want to say a little bit about that when you were 39, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, it was um, nine years ago, March, we met. Um, and it was 
initially it was really hard to fathom that now I was no longer going to be what I had been my whole life. So it was a really um, life altering identity changing process to meet him and to accept him and to um, accept that I was no longer abandoned or orphaned or right. So it was a really incredible transformative time for me. You know, Jessica, I, I, um, watched you one night on you, you and your dad were having a, a an online, uh, broadcast. And I think it was then that you mentioned something about being daddy's little girl or something. Do you, yeah. It, does that ring a bell? Well, so I remember thinking about that and I thought you and I have such parallels in our, yeah. I mean, the, it's uncanny how you and I just like, their similarities are almost eerie. But um, when you said that about being daddy's little girl, I, I, that so rung a bell with me because um, mm-hmm. I didn't have a father either um, mm-hmm. yeah. growing up. And so I ha- had no concept of how to relate mm-hmm. to a father. And yeah. so th- you, you don't know what you've, what you've missed out on. You, you don't, you don't know what it is that you missed out because you don't have that experience to go by. Right? right. So when you said daddy's little girl, I thought, I've never thought about that. I've never thought about yeah. that. I didn't get that, you yeah. know, that I didn't get that growing up, that I didn't get to experience what that would feel like. Mm-hmm. And, um, in our fatherless generation, I think how many people grow up, whether it's, I mean, and men, I know men, you don't want to admit it, but (laughs) they can feel this way too, without a father, not being able to identify with what it feels like to be daddy's little girl. Yeah. I mean, I I think maybe this is one place where we are a little different because I knew from a very, very young age that I was not like other girls Mm -hmm. because my friends all had dads. Oh. Yeah. They all had really strong dads, right? Mm-hmm. Um, in 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 the book, when we finally get that published, I actually talk about mm-hmm. when I remember noticing for the first time yeah. that I was different, mm-hmm. that when there were daddy-daughter things, that I didn't have that. And when I would go to my friends and their dads were present and they were fun and they were nice or kind or or, or whatever, that I had this absence and it made it, it was kind of the beginning of me finding fulfillment outside of my family and looking like it was where I began to embrace performance as a way of receiving love. And I began to embrace that I couldn't get fulfillment inside my home. I had to go elsewhere to get it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's how I felt too, because I grew up without a dad and it was just um, this void. Mm -hmm. Like there was a void. I didn't know what the void was. I didn't know why I felt that way. I knew things weren't right because, you know, as a kid, you can't really rationalize well. So you just know I've got these feelings. I don't know why I have these feelings but I just feel this way. I feel like something's missing in my life, but I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And so I was on this and I know that I don't feel good about me. There's something I don't like about me. My dad not being there, um, you know, probably has something to do with me. And so, you know, you go outside, just like you said, go outside the family to try Mm -hmm. to fill that lack, that boy. So Jessica, uh, uh, tell me how, after you met your dad, I know you were already grown a person. How did that influence you, your self-worth or as a daughter? Because a lot have changed, correct? Inside. Oh, yeah. So um, what it did for, let's see. Oh, there's so many things to say. Right. Um, so one of the things that, right, so I talked a little bit about the identity piece, right? So this is where I'm really thankful for Dr. Jim Richards, mm-hmm. because his influence in my dad's life allowed my dad to recognize that need for me. So there were a lot of little girl things that happened in the beginning of the relationship, right? So we, when we met, um, and I went to Kansas City for the first time, and we'd been uh, probably two months We'd been a family at that point, and 
we did some crazy things. Like they took me shopping and spent this cr ridiculous amount on clothing and whatever. And it was really about, we've never had a birthday with you. We've never had this opportunity to spoil you. We've never had any of these things. And so we went and did all this family stuff. Like we went and had family pictures done. And, and what happened in that moment was like this acceleration in all the things that were missing and the healing that started was so sudden and so fast. It was almost mm -hmm. like you just flipped a light switch and all of a sudden all these things were gone. And now here's this other beautiful thing unfolding in front of me. Right. It's like new you. You were born into new you to experience. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It completely changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's changed my relationship with my husband. It's changed my relationship with my own children. Mm -hmm. um, and it's even changed my relationship with my mm -hmm. birth, like my mom mm -hmm. and, and that whole side of my family. It's transformed how we interact. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Angel, before I ask you about your story with your dad, because you, you gave us little pieces, I'd like to focus more on you. Could you tell me to those that listen to you right now, those that are fatherless, that are younger kids, or maybe never met their fathers, never were you, Jessica. They never got it 39 years to know their father. So what would you tell them how to deal with this? I know there is no brief answer, but if you could just say the basic how to deal with those feelings of, oh, they went to daddy daughter dance and I didn't. Oh, they have the father and I don't. How? How to feel yeah, that? I, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, I think actually it's a short answer. Um, the application is long, but the answer is short. Um, mm -hmm. The one thing I think I would tell them is your human father is never going to be your source. Right. So all of those things don't come from our human father. That's the, what they were designed for, yes. but we're human and, and on this earth and we're all imperfect. Right. So if we go to our heavenly father for those identity things, when that lack happens, if we go and remember that our heavenly father provides us everything we need, he provides us all that love and all that connection. And honestly, this relationship with my earthly father has allowed me to recognize that that's exactly what I needed all those years when I was self-destructive and all those years when I was living in lack, all those years of scarcity where I felt like something was missing was all because I was missing the relationship with my heavenly father. It, it comes down to husbands as well, but we're going to talk about it later. Angel, would you take your uh, question? Would you talk uh, about your father? You gave us intro, but just talk about your father relationship because we know then you had stepfather. How did it look like? Mm -hmm. So um, most of my memories of my biological father are of uh, abuse. Um, because he was violent and um, would abuse my my mother um, severely to the point of hospitalizations and um, disfigurement you know it was it was really bad and um, so he was pretty scary <laughs> um, and he was an alcoholic he was a police officer and so, you know, it just was never, I never felt safe. And I was glad actually when they got divorced because I finally felt, you know, a degree of safety. Um, I didn't have to be concerned that, you know, I would have to watch him beat her. Now he never touched me. Um, that came later with my stepfather. Um, the the safety didn't the safety didn't last very long because it, you know my mother ended up remarrying a, a man who was actually worse than my father was um, because he did end up abusing um, all of us actually and uh, he was a drug addict and uh, there was uh, sexual abuse that went on for a period of years as well by someone else, not my stepfather. Um, did and he know about it? Can I, may I ask, did he, was he aware of this? No, no he one. Okay. 
Because um, I, I, my next nobody question, knew. Nobody. Knew about it. Okay, okay. And uh, so you know, this was my impression of a father. Yeah. Uh, because I had no nothing else. I had no other men in my life except for uh, a pastor who the pastor of the church that we attended and I loved him mm -hmm. dearly and I would spend time at their house and do sleepovers when I was growing up um he was the only sense of a father I ever had uh but you know that he wasn't real he wasn't able to be active in my life because he was the pastor of such a large large church and uh so you know he he was about the only sense of of a human father that I had, but that all culminated uh, into when my mother sat me down and said, you know, all these things that we've experienced, all these uh, abuses, all of these hard difficulties, um, God's allowing it to teach us uh, a lesson. And so I began to equate um, that picture of a human father with who God was and that just led to you know suicidal ideations i just didn't want to live because if god could be just as bad or worse than the human fathers that i had experienced um gosh i didn't stand a chance in mm. the world so I, I did not want to um, be in a relationship with a man that I was going to feel had any control, <laughs> any control over me or, or anything. I still wanted, I mean, we're, we're created to feel and uh, loved and want love. And that's a natural desire. And I still wanted that. I didn't feel loved. I'd experienced tremendous amount of rejection and abuse, but I still craved to be loved. And so uh, I still pursued relationships thinking that somehow, some magic way, I might find it. I might get lucky and I might find it. But, uh, you know, of course I didn't. Uh, I think I mentioned before that I had been married before and it was brief and it was <laughs> a big mistake. Uh, but, you know, I picked I picked this person because I thought it would be safe, and um, it wasn't. You exactly. just answered my next question. That was it. I was going to ask you, wow, because he was giving you a sense of security. Sure, yeah. But it was false no sense of security. Sure, yeah. No one can give you that because that comes from inside. Exactly. Now, that comes from inside your heart, what you experience between you and the Lord, not something external. But I didn't understand all that mm -hmm. at the time. You know, I was still um, playing it the world's way. I was still playing the world's game. Mm -hmm. So Wow. Well, uh, you know, let me give you a brief uh, picture of my childhood. Uh, but Jessica, I'm going to come back to the same question to you right after I will say this. Uh, about choosing your spouse, well, how did you base it? But uh, <clears throat> those that listen to us may be like Jessica, may be like Angel, or perhaps you grew up with wonderful father. I must say I'm very grateful. I was very blessed, even though I was born in communistic time in Poland. It's completely different culture. We talk about different mentality, different understanding, different sense of humor. I mean, the other side of the world, right? Uh, but still, we all are people. My dad was born in, in the early 1930s, uh, and um, it was right after Second World War. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was right after Second World War. So uh, to make it really short, fear. Any oh, in fact, he was Jewish. The entire his parents were Jewish, but they had to hide their identity in order to survive. It was right after the Holocaust. We talk about uh, they had to pretend that they are German. They somehow they moved to Germany. Make it short. Uh, he grew up as a German boy. Then as a uh, they told him, let's move to Poland. It's better. It's easier, and all that stuff. They're not gonna kill us. Hopefully, in Poland there was more merciful wow. people that if in case they discover that they're jewish they won't murder them or just call on them so 
but he learned German and oh, he was number 13 in the family. So imagine my background, that all comes down to me because it was downloaded in my four of my brothers and I, fear. Anytime, even I, when I was born, I remember any plane was coming, I was taught that our mentality was that third world war is coming. Whenever you heard those big planes and stuff. So you, uncertainty. He lived in, among buildings in big city, one of big cities in Germany, where you could live with, I mean, you saw ruins. You, you, you went outside, it's not like you see trees and uh, fields, you see ruins. You may find, till, I, till today I remember, I would find bones laying outside and I knew those were bones wow. of killed people. If I lived that 40 years ago, let alone my dad, seeing death, I mean, discovering as a little boy playing, oh, someone's leg, oh, someone's this, honesty. I don't even want to get to details. So with that fear mentality, uh, his father was taken uh, to Germany. They never knew even how he died and stuff. So with this fear and uh, complaining and uh, negativity, uh, Angel, at the last session you said, what our parents brought up this way, be, brought us this way because they, they, they were brought up this way. So imagine what, I didn't understand what kind of, and why was I growing up with very fearful and negative father until I grew up, until I understood his story. Cause you know, as a kid, you never pay attention to it. You're so self-focused and stuff. So make it short. I was very negative person. I was very passionate. My dad, Angel, I see your books behind you. And this, you, this reminds me of my home. My dad was sort of like, you know, Dr. Jim reminds me so much of my dad in some ways, passion. He would always learn. Uh, he lived and sleep with Bible and Corcon Cor Concordance. He, uh, he, we had so many books. My dad was encyclopedia till the point he became my guru. Whenever I didn't know something, he would teach me. He had answer for everything. He was known as a guy that would go in fire for God, amen. See, wonderful picture, right, of my daddy loving me. But on the other side, fear, condemnation. He believed God is well, sits with the whip and his patient is that far. Watch out, you don't cross the line. So I knew my dad was such a huge authority for me. I thought every answer was from God. Whatever he said, it was from God. So when he painted picture of angry God, I thought that's how God is. Even though my dad loved me like there's like crazy. So see, I lived with this mentality until I really got to know Dr. Jim uh, materials. I was so confused. I, I said, God, who are you? I want to serve you. I'm taught from child, from birth to serve you but I'm afraid of you mm -hmm. so this was such a shift for me incredible shift and maybe I'll give another session just based on that mm -hmm. but I want to show you what created me who I am today I had to overcome a lot of negativities and fear that was my main thing that almost destroyed my marriage as well but let's I don't want to get ahead of us because I brought it all to my marriage ah uh -huh. Let me just say something, Abby. Yeah. Um, you know, I was, I was uh, reading those verses about generational curses. Yes. And, you know, that we, there's this prevalent idea in Christianity that um, there are generational curses that are brought on by God. And we know um, if you study the Bible, you would know that that's actually not true. Um, because in multiple places, um, yeah. God actually says the opposite. But the, but the scripture that is used in Exodus to, um, I believe it's in Exodus, yes, where it talks about, um, uh, and, and he's have, uh, God is having a discussion with Moses up on the yeah. mountain and is talking about generational curses. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually not saying that God is going to make the children pay for the sins of the father. What it's mm -hmm. actually saying is, um, when I see your children grow up and I see their children grow up and their children grow up, I'm going to remember that you were raised by these parents who, you know, had this corruption 
not because they were bad people necessarily, but they their hearts were corrupted in some way. And they raised these children with a certain mindset, within a certain culture, within certain beliefs and philosophies and ideas. And that made that generation probably a little bit more harder uh, or uh, more against God and every generation thereafter. And he, what he's saying there is I'm going to remember when I see how you're suffering and how, you know, your life may be way off track. I'm going to remember how you got there. And, um, you know, I, I'm bringing that up because we're talking about our fathers. We're talking about how our fathers got where they are and then how we got that where they are. And I want to make sure that people understand. Yes. We, even though we um, are grown up in, in this environment, within the culture of the country that we live in, within the culture of the family unit that we live in, um, we still are sovereign. Mm -hmm. God is not ordaining us to have these experiences. He's not orchestrating it. He's not yeah. allowing it. He's not causing it. Uh, we are still sovereign. Our little hearts as children, that's what's so, that is what makes us who we are. Because even as babies, mm -hmm. even as little bitty babies, and we know this is true. If you, you studied any kind of, uh, psychology about babies, even babies make up their heart decisions, not their minds, but they make up their heart decisions. Yeah. And that's why you can see people, lots of kids in a family grow up with the same parents, but there's one that grows up different. Why? Because you're sovereign. They don't come out as little cookie cutters. You know, if, if, if socialism was true, that we are a product of our environment and we can't help it, how we are when we grow up, every child within the same family would come out exactly the same. Mm -hmm. That's why we know socialism isn't true. It's, it's a lie because we are not a product of our environment. We're a product of our beliefs. Mm -hmm. And so when, just because we have this family history, I want you all to understand you have the power of choice to make up your mind. Mm -hmm. You have the power and the authority. Nobody decides your mind for you. That's Nobody right. decides what you believe. <laughs> Nobody's going to decide uh, your actions tomorrow. No one's going to decide for you how you respond to this next conflict that you might get in. Right. No, no one is going to make those decisions for you. No one is going to decide how you feel. Mm -hmm. You are sovereign. And so even though we have this history, right? How mm -hmm. did we come out of it, girls? We came out of it because we made decisions. We mm -hmm. used our authority. We used our God-given power. We used um, the right that we have been given by God mm -hmm. to say, mm -hmm. I am going to decide yes. to have and be what God has said I can have and be. I do not want what I've had. I do not want to be what this is going to produce. Right. I am making a decision today to be who I want to be in Amen. Christ. Amen. Jessica, oh, would you like that. to? That's so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, what's coming to my mind is the, is the, when Jesus looked at the man and he said, pick up your man and walk. And the part that a lot of people miss in that verse is that, Jesus said, and the man chose, mm -hmm. right? He made a choice to pick up his mat. Jesus could look at him and say, pick up your mat and walk. And if he chose not to, then he'd still be laying on the mat. And I think we miss that we have not only the authority, but the ability to mm -hmm. say yes to something. So we have to choose. What are we going to say no to? And what are we going to say yes to? And yeah. I think, Angela, to your point, that basically the point is, we get to pick mm -hmm. and we you talk about, right. So you yeah. talk about where one kid comes out different than all the other kids in a sing in the same family. That's because that one kid has made a different choice. That yeah. one kid has said, you know what? I'm going to do this. Yes. I'm not going to do that. And mm -hmm. so I'm going to do everything I can to do this. Like there's so many books and 
psychological books and leadership books and neuroscience that show if we know where we're going and why we're going there. And if every decision we make focuses on that, then that's what's going to happen. So when Jesus asks us, are you going to pick up your mat and walk? We can say yes, because we know that that's where we want to go. Mm -hmm. We know that we want to go mm -hmm. in the direction of sovereignty, in the direction of authority, in the direction of freedom and power and peace mm -hmm. and hope and all those good things. I mean, that's exactly where we want to be. And we're making that choice. Mm -hmm. You know, sovereignty, Beautiful. the whole thing of sovereignty, the whole thing of authority, the whole thing of all, you know, my power has been so over mysticized um, right. because we want to make it seem like it's magical, like it's something that's happening out here somewhere. Let me tell you what authority is. Let me tell you what power is. Let me tell you what sovereignty is. Choice. Absolutely. I have laid before you life and death, God said. Yeah. And, and how do you get it? How do you get life? Tell me, wait a minute, don't, wait, don't say it. Don't, don't, <laughs> wait, wait, because it's, it, it, you know, how do you get life and how do you get death? Girls, tell me. Choose. What did he say? Choose. It's so That's how simple. you do it. We make Make it so complicated. Uh -huh. yeah. you bring it down to every day. Um, yeah. Choose not to be angry wife. I choose not to be negative mother. Yeah. I choose not to think this and this, but through the bur bur death, burial, and yeah. resurrection. The I choose to be patient. I choose yeah. to walk in love. Right. Uh -huh. I choose yeah. to forgive. I yeah. choose not to pass judgments. And if I do, mm -hmm. I'll send them away. Okay. You're supposed to do what Jesus said to do in these yeah. situations. That's how we, our authority and our power comes within our power to choose what we are going to believe, yes. what we're going to say, and what we're going to do next. What am I going to do right now? Because I really, I really want to take mm -hmm. your head off, husband. Mm -hmm. I really, <laughs> really want to get you right now. What am I going to do? Uh -huh. am, am I going to do it? Mm -hmm. I, no one's going to make that decision for me but me. No. But hold on. I hear somebody saying, like, a, let's say, comment, but you don't know I'm brought up this way. I can't change it no more. That's how my parents taught me. Oh my gosh. Well, oh, there's so much there. Like it's yeah. so much of it's Choose. this, it's this, it's a cop out. I uh -huh. mean, I'm going to be a little hard, right? It's a cop out when you're talking about, Oh, well, my parents are this way or, Oh, well, I'm this way. Non -stop. And it's always been that way. It's an excuse. That's it is an excuse. To stay That's the same way. It's, it's a victim mentality. Yeah. And it's codependency. It is. Because what it comes down to, what does my um, choice uh, re, uh, stem from? Mm -hmm. Personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If, if I am not going to be personally responsible for what I believe, my actions, what I think, what I say, what I do, then I am naturally going to, if I don't want to, to, to be responsible, I'm going to make someone else responsible mm -hmm, for it. Mm -hmm. That yeah, is yeah. victimhood. And that's what, that is what a person is doing. Now they don't like Labor. it when you say that and they're going to say that's not, a, well, you don't understand. Mm -hmm. No, we, we understand because we were victims. We, come oh, on girls, yeah. we, we were victims too. We did that whole thing before I did that for a long time. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm a victim because you know, my dad left and I'm yes. abandoned and feel sorry for me. And I've got this hard mother yes. and you know all this yeah. hey hey girl if anybody's got an excuse to be a victim mm -hmm. I mean I think my past would qualify you know <laughs> because I actually really was I mean we you know all what? were in this thing yeah. you know what at the very bottom of this it's self-centeredness we want to throw pity Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and there's secondary gain in being a victim. Come on. I mean, let's just be honest. There's second, you get attention, you oh, know, yeah. I mean, really at the end of the day, you, that, even though it's a negative attention, people feeling sorry for you, yes. it's still attention. Yes. And so, yeah. and so that is a, a, a substitute for love. Mm -hmm. that you're trying to get. And so, you know, we know this, we know this cause we've done it. Yeah. <laughs> we've all done it right mm -hmm. and so uh but it it doesn't it's that is not real love mm -hmm. it doesn't, no. it's not lasting it's momentary it gives you a little something in the moment but it never lasts because you keep mm -hmm. got to doing it more you keep got to get and 
you never can have good relationships in a victim codependent type situation. And so you always, you're not in peace. There's no peace in a, in a victim mentality. No. And so you always feel in lack. Victims feel like they got uh, the raw end of the deal, right? I mean, we feel like, oh, I'm not, you know, my dad left me and, uh, you know, my, my life is this way or, you know, I've got poverty, you know, going on. Like, I, we, we grew up in poverty. Like, I, I, my mom had to send us um, to the neighbor's house to eat sometimes, you know. I mean, I understand that you as a child don't have control over a lot of those situations, but eat, but your heart is still going to make decisions. Yes. And yeah. it, that is what is going to determine ultimately yeah. how life turns out for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think our, our, our backgrounds are so similar. Sometimes it's terrifying. Um, my, <laughs> one of my first memories as a kid is being afraid and being hungry. Yeah. Like we were so poor and the abuse was so rampant and there was, I mean, mm -hmm. Angel, just like you, it's, you know, it's physical, it's emotional, it's sexual. Like there's all these different types of abuse in there and I have every reason. Yeah. Like, and I'm justified in yeah. being a victim. Like mm -hmm. I have every reason to be angry and to be hurt and all that. And all, but by choosing all of that, mm -hmm. it blows up every relationship I have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now everything is someone else's fault mm -hmm. and I have these reasons to act ugly and oh, well, you just have to understand because you don't come from where I came from. Mm -hmm. Like you're just going to have to accept me as this obnoxious know-it-all. Yeah. Like, because for me, it turned into this hyper performance. So I was a know-it-all and I was the overachiever and always leading and everyone, every relationship was a competition. Yeah. Because if I get the grade, if I get the trophy, if I be, win the competition, then I, you're going to love me more. Yeah. You're going to accept me more. <laughs> I'm not going to be abandoned. And, and so those were the choices, right? Yeah. And on the outside, it looks like I got it all together. I'm this great leader and I've got all these successes and this great career and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and I mean, that, that's really what it is. It's all a bunch of garbage because on the inside, I was rotting and dying. Yeah. every day a little bit more. And I was vomiting that on my family, yeah. vomiting that on my friends. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Uh, you see, it brings me to that question that you both kind of answered already. How did you choose what season of your life mentally, spiritually, where were you when you chose your spouse? Angel told us already kind of, but just maybe you could continue again first. And uh, based on what did you chose your husband? See, based, based, lack of security, lack of something, or yes? Yeah, yeah. So you can see in the background the Marine Corps flag, right? So my husband and I were both in the military. Are you um, saying our rock? Our rock. I don't bark. <laughs> <laughs> the Marines do all that barking. I don't, I don't, I'm not good at it. <laughs> We don't have a voice for it. I, it just doesn't sound right coming from a woman's voice. Well, I mean, if I was a Marine, <laughs> it would sound okay. like they teach you how to do it. But I was Air Force, so meh. Uh -huh. like, okay. <laughs> we, we don't do that stuff. Um, so he, with the day that he, we met, mm -hmm. he was in um, dress blue deltas. So if you know the Marine Corps uniform, so it's long sleeve, mm -hmm. a tie, blue pants with the, with the red striped gown, right? So he's got all of his ribbons on there and he looks like this war hero, right? Because he's been a lot of places and he's done a lot of things. And I see this and immediately I'm like, this guy has got it together. Mm. He's a Marine, so I am secure. He is strong, oh. so I am safe. He is a leader, so I can take that hat off and I can be led. Like all these issues from my childhood played into that factor. Like I'm safe, I'm secure. The perimeter is guarded yeah. because I have this Marine. Yes, your all fulfillment of that wound, yeah. emptiness, pew, goes. Yeah, absolutely, and he was a very strong very confident personality and he just put forward this image of power I'm like mm -hmm. yeah I need that in my life now to be fair he still puts on all that kind of stuff 
and I love it. But oh. that's cool. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, Abby, I um, shared a little bit because we did a, um, a interview last week. But um, uh, when I got married the first time, that was I just um, it, it was just pure stupidity. I'm sorry. <laughs> there's there's nothing like um, it. That was a com it was a complete rebellious act um, and against my mother. So I can't really say I married him because of any deep seated things other than I just wanted to prove to my mother, you can't control me. So it was just like, and this is the ultimate way oh. I'm doing this deal. You don't have any say, boom, you know? So, and it was, I it was just, a, it was dumb and you know, whatever. So it didn't last long <laughs> because it was for all the wrong reasons, of course. Yes. Um, but uh, poor guy. <laughs> but, poor guy. Uh, and he wasn't a bad guy. Just you know, wasn't he? He couldn't survive me. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, but I did make a decision after that um, to be that I would never get married again. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, like I shared with you, Abby, last week, yes. um, you know, at this time I had come to Huntsville, Alabama. I would, had gone to, uh, Bible college at impact mm -hmm. and I had gotten some, some truths in my heart. I got, the, I got the main one in my heart, but I got some other truths as well. Mm -hmm. And I reckon, and I was, I've always been pretty self-aware, which I think mm -hmm. is another thing that has always kind of saved me. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've always been willing to, um, own my part mm -hmm. you know I, I yeah. if I if I can see it I'm gonna own it because I know that's my way out but uh so I I would I'm very reflective and uh I will think about things so I recognized that if I got married again I would just it would be for all the wrong reasons and so basically I decided that when I got married again it would be not because I was going to be a taker not because I was going to need something from mm -hmm. someone. It was because I wanted to give. And uh, so it was seven years or longer before I got married again, because mm -hmm. I knew there were things in my heart that I needed to work out first. And so when I met Travis, um, I think I told you the first time I saw him, um, he, I, my first he looks like a gentle giant. <laughs> and so I, and, and in, that was actually something I had been missing yeah. in my life. I didn't share this part with you. Um, but uh, one of the reasons I named my two daughters that we adopted from China, Grace and Mercy, was because those were two things I'd never experienced in my life. Mm -hmm. I'd never experienced mercy. Mm -hmm. I'd never experienced um, gentleness or compassion, uh, it, at least that was impressionable to me. I know people were showing it to me because I was messed up and I made a lot of mistakes. I know people showed it to me, but because I'd never had that modeled to me consistently throughout my childhood, I didn't even recognize it when people were, were actually showing it to me. Mm -hmm. So when I looked at him, my first thing was, he's, a, he's like this gentle giant. He just oozed gentleness. Oh. And I thought, gosh, I, I don't know, because I'd grown up with such harshness. My world was so harsh. And that was the attraction uh, initially, because I just thought, wow, what would it be like to be with around somebody who is just so kind? Wow. And gentle? You know what? I find here uh, a similarity to my way of uh, how I found my husband. That's what caused, uh, caught me right away, tender and gentle heart. He's not like my dad. He's not aggressive. My dad was also in military. He was retired police officer and all that stuff. So he had that uh, inside him. Yeah. It was awesome, yes, on one side, but again, that other side. And I remember growing up thinking, I will never choose someone like him. I'll never choose someone like him. Oh, yes, I love his wisdom. But again, that aggressive part. And my husband... He is total opposite. Oh, I love him. I came back to my girlfriend's house uh, where I, we used to live in Chicago after I moved from Poland from first date with my husband. And I said, they said, how was it? I said, first thing, first impression. He is so gentle. I love no, him. Oh, oh. 
<laughs> well, you know, I, 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 yes. I know, Jessica, you can relate. And, and now that I hear your story, Abby, because I didn't know your story, by the way, um, mm -hmm. about your uh, background. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that attracted me to, to Travis, to my husband, was mm -hmm. he was not going to try to shape me or mold me. I had, I had had this person in my life who was my mother mm -hmm. um, constantly trying to shape me mold me into who she thought That's I was mm -hmm, me, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. was just a little mini me, you know, I was supposed <laughs> to be a mini little, a mini me of her. That's what she wanted, which meant, you know, the message I got back, which I didn't understand at the time, but the reverse message that I got back psychologically was you're, you're no good. Yeah. You as you, you're no good. You are not good unless you're like me. So mm -hmm. I have to reject who you are. Mm -hmm. I need to remold you. I need to, you know, like put you back in the mold again mm -hmm. and reshape you and, you know, put you in the, in the, you know, fire you in the fire, whatever, how you ever do and pull you back out so that you look more like me. So mm -hmm. you're more like I am. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up with incredible rejection. Yeah. And so, uh, so when I married him, so when, when, or when we got together, I began to realize this is not a person who's interested. He, he just accepts, accepts me like I am. Oh. And he is, he's, and he's always been that way. I mean, mm -hmm. we've been together for like um, 20 years now and mm -hmm. he never tries to change me ever. Mm -hmm. Like I know he wishes I would. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. He wishes I would sometimes, <laughs> but he never ever says, mm -hmm. you know, what's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. Or why don't you do this? Or why, you know, what's, he's never, ever trying to change who I am. Mm -hmm. And that I'm telling you growing up the way I did, and I know you all can relate. It's like, mm -hmm. <sighs> I can be around you and just be me, even mm -hmm. when me doesn't look so good mm -hmm. or sound so good or act so good. Mm -hmm. I can just be me. Yeah. Well, Jess, uh, I'm gonna let you say, but I just wanna say before I forget something to uh, Angel. Uh, you know what, that's how I almost destroyed my husband. I was constantly, I was that spiritual, holy moly uh, lady from, you know, always worship, a big time worship leader. I married my beautiful, my awesome, really gentle, humble husband, but he wasn't, let's say, as spiritual as me, you know what I mean? So I constantly was trying, first 10 years, I was trying to change him. We are married 17 years, thank God. Change him, change him, criticizing. And that was the worst thing. If you listen to this, please stop changing your husband. Stop criticizing him. Even if you are yeah. all that spiritual, please stop. Please just love him. Please just yeah, respect please. him. Come on, Jessica, keep talking. No, you, you go ahead. Yeah, so it's funny because the guy that I picked, right, two yeah. things. Um, mm -hmm. One, we were both so insecure that we were constantly trying to change each other and constantly trying to control one another. So what we end up with is two alphas who are battling for control, mm -hmm. right? So my way of protecting myself as a kid was I learned how to control my environment by performing mm -hmm. and if things didn't fit in that mold like i've got to fix this i've got to change this and so what that turned into is like he would get upset about something and so i would run around and make the kids behave a certain way and make you know clean the house and make sure everybody did their homework and like and i would create this perfect environment perfect environment that wasn't actually perfect <laughs> and then he would come home and never deal with being upset or being you know like we were never able to be ourselves because we had to be this whole other thing because of an environment that I created out of my own insecurity. And then when I realized that I was doing this, my flip was instead of me controlling all the environment, I'm gonna control him. Mm. So he needs to go to church and he needs to read the Bible and he needs to this and he needs to that. And why don't you join this group? And why don't you go to this yep. thing? And you mm. should go this and you should go that. And it was shoot, never shoot, ever shoot. me. That's the worst thing, quit shooting your spouse. Oh, it was so bad. It was so bad. He looks at me at one point and he's like, I'm never going to be you. <laughs> and my husband he actually you know told me, he's I'll like, never I'm be never going to turn into a woman and be Jessica. Stop <laughs> trying to make me Jessica. Yes, it's true. It was so though. bad. That's how I felt growing up. I had to be mini me mom, you know? Yeah. And it has been... Um, you know, my mother died 10 years ago. And as much as I love her, 
not having to feel that way, mm -hmm. um, you know, not having to uh, feel like I somehow let her down because I wasn't enough like her. Wow, has been so, the I think the pow the the power of acceptance is so underrated. You know, just Absolutely. accepting people as they are, yeah, um, is is it is incredibly therapeutic um, right. for both for both a person who's doing the acceptance the yeah. the accepting and the person who's being accepted. When yeah. you live under constant criticism or the fear of criticism. Oh my gosh, yeah. The fear of being criticized. Mm. Fear of wondering, am I measuring up or, or you know, I don't. Always it, guilty, it, always I'm guilty. You're always. I, I, yeah, yeah, I feel You're like I'm feel guilty wrong. all the time, even yeah. though I, you know, I don't know if I have done something wrong, but it just might be, and I don't know, it's common. The, that is, that is not a, a way of life. It's not peace. It's not peace for the person who's doing the criticizing and it's not peace for the person who's being criticized. And when you're in a relationship like that, I promise you, it's gonna okay. blow up. You rip your yeah. heart apart like blow. this. You grab his heart's peace and you just rip it off. Well, the Bible even talks about there's no peace with a nagging wife, right? Well, let me tell you about what happened in my marriage because mm -hmm. it did exactly that. In 2016, mm -hmm. I moved out of my house for six months. Mm because we were so destructive and so broken. Yes. And I had been on this journey with Jim and, and heart physics and learning about who I was in Christ and all mm -hmm. that. And I realized how destructive we were. Yeah. And I remember we had, that, Jessica, we had just met. Yeah. We yeah, just, for the that, first time. That was in 2016, you're right. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I had moved out and we were in this awful place and, and it was a place that I had to learn that I created. Wow. Like yeah. that was what allowed, that's what allowed me to seek intensive counseling. That's what allowed me to take this, this heart journey seriously for the really, for the first time to really go deep, to understand that I was abandoned and I was insecure and I was all these things mm -hmm. that were lies. And I was looking to Leroy. I was yeah. looking to my poor husband to fill those needs. Yeah. And until, well, make all and, and this is just my side, like he had work to do for himself, but, but the stuff that I did allowed me to see that this was not his burden. I was expecting like feed my need for security, feed my need for protection, feed my need for all this stuff. Oh. Instead of looking to the one source, Jesus, who could do all that, right? And yeah. so I finally go through this cataclysmic event and experience the depth of the truth. Yeah. Understand who Jesus is. Understand who I am in him. And yeah. for the first time now, I can look at Leroy and go, you know what? I appreciate that you provide security, but you are not my security. That is not his identity. That is not my identity. And then I, when I separated those two, then all of a sudden, um, Isaiah 32, 18, my people will live in secure houses of rest. I, I'm not quoting it exactly because I don't have it in front of me, but that became the verse for our marriage, that we would have a secure home, a place of rest, a place of peace, that that would be who we are. And it transformed us into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was like, my people will live in peaceful dwelling places in secure homes in undisturbed places of rest. That's in the uh, there New International Version. And so now what I have is I have my four adult children come to the house and they want to be here. They want to be here. Like with, with That's all right. this current situation, most of them moved home. Wow. Yeah. So that's like a my, <laughs> they wanted to go, they wanted to go anywhere but here because we were nuts yeah. and now they're here. Mm -hmm. And it's so incredible that our relationships are restored and we have fun and we laugh and we play mm -hmm. and we have such a great time and we're all, all allowed to be ourselves. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. You know, we, we mm -hmm. so often, um, are looking for, like you say, I want you to feel this need yeah. in my life, right? 
well, you're not doing that. So you need to change because you're doing these things over here that are making the opposite of what I want you to do. I want you to do this. So there's something wrong with you. You need to change. Yeah. And we so often are looking externally for an internal sense of peace based on someone else changing in order to be who we want them to be in order to make us feel like they want to feel yeah and i'm telling you that that way of life is exhausting mm. and it never gets you where you want to go never and and if you know, i don't know how many times you i'm sure you girls have talked to women all over the place and it's the same story yes you know, over and over and over again if my husband would just do this, well, how do I deal with my husband when he's, you know, how uh, my husband won't uh, uh, do this and that, and he's over here doing this and that, and it's always about what the husband is doing. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you, if you, you will never get there if your eyes are on your husband. Absolutely. Never, never, so, never, never. You know, yeah, exactly. I couldn't agree more. What freed me, there were a few, uh, let's say, statements that really led me out of my darkness. I told you I was trying, I was chronic complainer, nonstop trying to change my husband. I said, if you truly, someone said that. If, so I'm telling you today, listener, if you want to change your spouse, change you. That's Amen. Right. Change yeah. you. Yeah, I have to but change that, myself to own, my marriage. Uh -huh. Yeah, you got to own own you first. You have got to, because what it was it say? You, what does Matthew say? Get the plank out of your own eye first before you Ooh. start trying to get the, the speck out of so your good. neighbor's eye, right? You know, yeah. we, we want to criticize and make everyone else responsible for how we feel. But yes. I promise you, mm -hmm. there is there is something, mm -hmm. a, a place beyond just relief. Mm -hmm. So many people are just looking for relief. I'm sorry. Relief is, relief is subpar. Yeah. You, you want peace. You yeah. want peace. And the only way to have peace mm -hmm. is when you say, all right, I'm, I'm going to deal with me. Not because you're going to fix you. Not mm -hmm. because there's something wrong with you, That's right. mm -hmm. but because you understand that it is how I'm seeing this thing. It's how I'm approaching this thing. It's what I believe about this. It's my perspective that's all askew here. And, and I need to uh, address my, and someone asked me about prayer the other day. Mm -hmm. And we often, often get so, there are all different kinds of prayer, but I promise you, it always starts with one thing, prayer. Assessing and reconciling your beliefs. Then you can go into a meditative prayer. Then you can go into uh, the prayer of Thanksgiving or the prayer of agreement or intercessory prayer and all these other types of prayers that people talk about, but you won't ever have effective prayer until you assess and reconcile. And assess and reconciling is when you deal with what you believe, how you see it. And you say, you know what? I've got this working in me from maybe my past, how my dad treated me or how I grew up, my stepfather treated me. And I have been projecting that onto the world. I've been projecting that onto my relationships when I need to, I need to forgive this. I need to send this away. I need to deal with this. And I need to say, what does God say about this? Too yeah. often we, we are, we are, I told my kids this morning, we, we, uh, we do our family God time every morning, right? Uh -huh. And I told my kids that this morning, we are living by the word of a father who abandoned us, a mother who uh, was imperfect. We're living, we're living our lives based on the words and actions of these people who have hurt us. Mm -hmm. how, yep. how, how crazy is that? When we've got a Bible full of God's word, mm -hmm. that if we would apply that to our lives, we mm. could have the promises that come along with it. Mm. So let me let me talk about that for a second. Yeah, so do. the decision that I made that I was going to have peace, right? So in the process, like my husband and I have reconciled, I've come back home, all that. 
and I'm looking, I want my house to be peace. So what are the decisions that I have to make? And so for the last four years, I made a bunch of changes and now I serve in a couple of places outside. Like I have, I have a, my full-time work, but other than that, everything I do is here. Yeah. Right. So, so I'm, I'm home because of the world situation and I'm enjoying that I'm home. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, happy to be here. I don't want to go anywhere else. For yeah. two months, I didn't go anywhere other than to work and home. Mm-hmm. And I was here and it was incredible. There was no draw where before I was seeking constantly, what can I be involved in so that I feel adequate? What can I, how, where can I perform? Where can I be the leader? Where can I be the, the center stage for whatever yeah. it is? Yeah. And that's all gone mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. my home is filled with peace and with joy and with connection and with relationship mm-hmm. because I stopped looking outside of myself yes. and chose to yeah. look inside mm-hmm. and correct, not correct. That's the wrong word. And to get with God about the truth of who I am, mm-hmm. to look into his word, to understand that I am chosen and loved and beautiful and a masterpiece and that he decided before the beginning of time that I was all those things. So who am I to say that that's wrong? Yeah. And so I look at him and he is beautiful. He is wonderful. He is love and he is joy. He is kind and he is all these things. And when those things sync up, man, life is good. Mm-hmm. beautiful yeah. wow. it's like you put those pink glasses on all of a sudden your spouse is wonderful your children aren't that like you saw in before <laughs> life is awesome. they're not crazy and you can laugh at their bad boy jokes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> you know you answered my two last questions <laughs> i was talking about jessica how did you i wanted you to talk about choosing the right job that doesn't interfere or competes with your family. But you just answered that. Angel, would you like to talk about it? Sure. Um, So, well, for years I didn't work um, because I, uh, we, we adopted two uh, children from China and there were special needs. And so that, that took up a whole lot of my time, um, you know, dealing with their special needs and, you know, medical things. Um, but, um, I, that was a wonderful period of time for me because it allowed me to, um, study a lot, study the, the Bible, mm-hmm. um, in a way that I hadn't really been able to do before. Mm-hmm. So, because I was at home, you know, all the time and I just could be able to do it. So I was real fortunate to be able to stay home with my kids. And, uh, so it's only been a few years, <clears throat> excuse me, that I, um, have started working again at impact and um, but I get to do it from home because you know my my kids are still you know living at home mm-hmm. and they still are dealing with some you know their medical things and uh, such but um, what i what I've been able to come to is that because I've been able to pursue something that I'm passionate about, it's it's kind of like not working in a way like it is work but it's not work because um i'm doing what i'm passionate about right i mean it says if you if if you go if you pick a job or a career that you um that love, you love it's not work. you'll never work a day in your life right that saying and mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. yeah i mean i'm not saying every day feels that way i'm not gonna <laughs> pretend that i do but um because i get to work from home yeah. and i'm and i'm working for a purpose that is greater than myself mm-hmm. and um you know being a blessing and I'm also getting blessed in return when I see people's lives change when we do stuff like this and I hear your stories and how you're you know I'm being blessed in return mm-hmm. and it's just all part of the day there's no real um separation of the two we get up in the morning we have our god time and then I you know, come down and work. And then I go back upstairs and we have lunch together and then I come back and, and, you know, it's just this back and forth. So there's no real separation. I'm not, I'm not really, 
explaining it that well, but very good, um, very good. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's awesome. Very good. So, so you were able to find this. Many moms couldn't find it. They have to go to work. They have to, but still, there is hope for them. They can still find that it's all up to our will. You can still find time to pray with your children, to talk to them, to read them Bible, to connect with them, spend quality time. Jessica? Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, I have been actually close to 30 years in a career um, with the military and, and other parts of the Department of Defense, and that has been, um, I, I've been gone a lot, right? So, I mean, I'm out of the house full time. Um, I've deployed several times, right? So, so yeah. I have not had that sort of perfect job for my life, right? So, mm -hmm. um, what I have found mm -hmm. though is now I'm able to have conversations that I weren't, wasn't before because I went through this phase of being legalistic and I was a holy roller and beating my kids with the Bible in a negative way um, and and so now we can have a different conversation mm -hmm. and as they're adults it changes right so now it, my role as as mom is more in the friend and counsel kind of department than it is in the developing and nurturing kind of department so it's been an interesting transition to be able to have these other conversations with them mm -hmm. and to model to them the love of God to model to them generosity and kindness and joy and peace and and praying and believing that that their lives will change yeah. because of it. No, okay, let me just say something real quick because <clears throat> I haven't always had what I have right now with the you know being at home and and the girls and things like that because prior to being here we li we lived in another house and with my girls having so many um, medical needs um, and having to see so many different, uh, you know, physicians and therapists and things like that over, I mean, my kids uh, combined so far have had 25 surgeries. Oh. That, those, that's just surgeries. Um, they have multiple conditions. So that requires that we see multiple doctors and teams of doctors and they have ongoing care that goes on um, plus therapy. I mean, we were doing therapy um, several hours a day, every day, like four days a week, um, uh, a couple of years ago for about two years, exactly. which meant I, sp I, I, I counted it up one day, I was spending 30 hours in the car a week. Oh, That's a lot. So what I'm saying is, is I didn't always, I didn't always have it like I have today mm -hmm. um, because you know I was going here and going there and, and and even when I came here and started working because I because of where we lived I was spending an incredible amount of time in the car mm -hmm. and um, you know I have to drive several hours to a doctor's office so wow. all that to say is um, you know we, we've got seasons I understand where where sometimes we got to do these extra things yeah. But but what my but what I want to emphasize here is you know you may not have what we call the luxury of being at home and doing exactly what you want the exact way you want to do it but let me tell you mm -hmm. when your heart gets in peace first your life will follow girls I mean that right you're not going to make yeah. peace happen out here. Mm -hmm. I need to get the perfect job, then I'll feel at peace, right? I need to have it. I need all of the stars to align. I need all my circumstances, and I need to try to manipulate them and make them all be, then I'll be happy. Then I'll feel at peace. I'm telling you. Greatest lie, moms believe it. They, that's they the greatest do. lie. Yeah, so, so you have to get your heart in peace first. That's right. Then it's a domino effect. Mm -hmm. A natural, you, all you, you, it's like that first domino is the one that's peace and it just, it not, and it, it filters on to everything else. Yes, once you reconcile, once you know that, you know, the aspect of identity, you gotta know who you are in Christ, what Jesus did to, for you and who he made you through the finished work of the cross. That's when you get peace. 
That's when your life gets in line. There's no other way. I testify, Jess testifies, Angel testifies, and I'm telling you, everyone that went through this path, through this journey, is the testimony. It works. It is truth. It is truth. Mm -hmm. girls I don't want to keep you too long I know it's long session I hope that our listeners are still there with us last session I promise when we're gonna close it when did well you kind of answer again you answering as we go along I love this when did you realize that your marriage was your first most important priority and your kids of course but talking about marriage when did Mm -hmm. you uh, when was that moment in your marriage the day that I decided to move out if that makes any sense, it sounds so weird. Yes. No, you yeah. bounce off but, the, the but bottom. I realized that, that, that the marriage that I longed for was never going to happen unless we had a catalyst, right? Mm-hmm. And at that time now, my husband calls that his reset. Wow. Because it was like we took and pushed the reset button yes. and started all over again. So now all of a sudden, mm-hmm. we have this beautiful friendship and we have this deep connection and intimacy that, that didn't exist before. Yeah, And it was at that point when I made that decision that if I was going to have peace and hope and joy and love and fruitfulness in my marriage, that that was that decision. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah for, for me, Abby, I, I know probably I already said this, but That's I decided point. that before we got, before we got married, That's what I, I knew that, um, you know, marriage was going to be the second most important thing I would ever do. And who I married was going to determine whether I ever fulfilled my dreams and goals. I knew it would have a a huge effect on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's why it took me so long to get married. Seven years. Yes, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. Yeah. So that for me, I, I understood that before. I'm not saying that I've always done, you know, I, did, I just want to say this because it's going to sound like, um, uh, you know, we've got the perfect lives here. Like we've overcome it all and we've arrived and, and, you know, we don't ever have any issues. Come to my house and see how it, li- how it is. <laughs> yeah, that is far from the truth. That is far from the truth. Is, I just, so I just called at Travis yesterday. <laughs> Okay. interview our husbands <laughs> but but let me tell you but let me tell you uh-huh. life is one step at a time we, we're looking for a magic pill right we're looking for the magic bullet we're looking to go oh i want to go from here yes to here <laughs> in one big giant step uh-huh. life doesn't work that way life no. works one step at a time and that and and i know that doesn't necessarily sound appealing mm-hmm. to a lot of people especially when you're mired in a lot of junk and and yeah. pain and you're suffering you want to go whoosh, out i get it mm-hmm. you can feel that way on the inside when mm-hmm. you finally surrender your heart to the lord mm-hmm. and you begin to come out of those things mm-hmm. but life is a journey mm-hmm. it's not just a it's not just a, oh, you know, what, what was the show where twinkle, she would twinkle her nose and she was somewhere else. Life no, it, oh, doesn't no. happen like that. Uh-huh. Life one step because I apply one principle. I've, I'm applying this principle mm-hmm. and I begin to see change. And now I'm going to apply this to my life. I'm mm-hmm. going to apply this to my heart. I'm going to apply mm-hmm. this to my behavior. Mm-hmm. And life begins to change one step at a time. We've taken steps, right, girls? I mean, we've st- taken step after step after step after step, mm-hmm. and um, that's how we've made it this far. We're still not all the way there. Mm-hmm. And but the key is we patience. Might take some steps back, right? Yeah. We might take some steps back, uh-huh. but we know this is this is because now we've got some track record, right? We we we've got some proof that this way works, and so we just keep taking another step and another step, and you can too. Mm-hmm. Amen. That was good. A key is the patience. I have so many people that write to us. They said, you know, I've tried. I left. I didn't arrive. And I just got discouraged. I slipped back and uh, helped me. I said, no, you help yourself. Turn that patience yeah. on. Jess, you want to say something to the listeners uh, before we go? Yeah, you know, um, take joy in the journey. And I say that because this is where I'm at, right? This is where I am right now. Mm-hmm. I am a, once I see where I want to go, mm-hmm. I'm what Angel described. I want to go from right here 
all the way over and I don't want to mess with this middle stock. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I'm in the process of yeah. actually persuading my heart to enjoy mm -hmm. the journey. Mm -hmm. Take one step at a time. Mm -hmm. Love that step. Love the step that you're on for the moment that you're on it. Mm -hmm. And yes. yeah. it will, I mean, it's just, there's peace there. Yeah. Right. So, um, Jim talks about the uh, three sentences exercise, right? Where, where right before you go to bed, you write three sentences and specifically one is, um, the one that I'm writing now is I treasure my journey mm -hmm. because I, it, because it is not in my nature to treasure the journey. It is in my nature to treasure the destination. Yes. And I don't want that because what it does is it wreaks chaos around me. It mm -hmm. makes it so that I'm not at peace all day long. And so I would also say that we aren't perfect. You know, Angel talked about, you know, you had a thing with Travis yesterday. I yelled at Leroy an hour before this call. <laughs> like, so we are not oh, perfect. Nice. We do not have it all together. No. <laughs> do not. Oh, that's we so treasure funny. our journey. Yes. Uh, yes, absolutely. I'm so glad that you said that because you know, even if you're not having a peace mm -hmm. over here or the outcome that you want over there, mm -hmm. you can still be at peace because yeah. you know everything's good between me and you, God. And even though I may have just yelled at yelled at him an hour ago, or I just yelled at my kids, you know, a few hours ago or whatever, or I just lost it and I didn't have patience, or I feel discouraged, or I'm looking out here and I'm seeing all these things, I can run back to my father because we started out this conversation about our fathers right and we know that god is not like the fathers that either we didn't have or the fathers that we did have that really let us down mm -hmm. we know god is perfect and yeah. we know that he's never going to let us down. He's never gonna, going to abandon us. He's never going to reject us. He's never going to give up and yeah. go, oh, you're just a lost cause. You're just wow. too much work. You're getting on my nerves. You're never going to be good enough. No, we can run to him and know with him, even if everything else yeah. is falling apart, he's there with open arms to welcome us into his heart and love us so we can be daddy's little girl amen that good oh. and that's what we pray for you yes remember yes. you are on this journey with us yeah with god yes but we all are here and you are victorious it's your choice god yes. gave it gave everything to you everything every yeah. step you're never alone girls can you testify you were never alone at any step even those the, the worst day of your life god is with us that's right that's <laughs> right he's always there always thank god. god this has been so good thank you abby it was thank, thank you, you so guys much. so much bye-bye bye thank you <laughs>